So it, it, this is really a tremendous honor for me to be here. And thank you, um, Bruce, f um, for the introduction. Um, it was really touching. Um, it's, um, I'm very appreciative of all the wonderful colleagues I've interacted with who've really helped me bring me here. And I'm in particular, as Bruce was saying, this is a great honor for me because uh, Britain Chance was a great mentor to me. As such, in hopes of honoring him, um, in hopes of honoring him in his memory, I decided I wanted to use this opportunity to talk about my relationship with BC and how it has brought me here. So um, it started uh, really in 1992 in, during the spring, during um, a graduate seminar in physics, and I met Arjun Yod. He was presenting um, his work on using diffusing light to study the structural and dynamic properties of colloidal systems. I thought that was really quite interesting work, so I went to talk to him afterwards to see if he had any projects I could work on. So he was working in the physics department, I was in the physics department, and he told me just the week before, he had taken some random walk across campus and um, met Britton Chance, who was also using diffusing light to study not colloidal systems, but tissue. So he suggested that I go over and meet him and see if there was some possibility to bridge between um, his lab and, and Arjun's lab. I didn't yet know the force, I mean the um, power of the um, random walk, um, so I took a more direct path to Britton Chance's lab, met him in his office, um, and in between phone calls and his organizing his next big seminar talk, um, he had a few words with me and said, David, when can you get started? So I was uh, very excited about that opportunity, and um, it's really truly by accidental chance that I met Britton Chance, right? Um, and, and it brought me here. So just uh, go through this quickly. Bruce was just saying the same thing, telling you about his career. I just wanted to add some um, personal notes to this. Um, during his, the World War II and his radar lab days, where he was running a group of 300 people at one point, um, I remember once picking him up at MIT and, and driving with him to Harvard, and we passed Building 20. And he just started reminiscing on and on about his stories in Building 20. And then we went through Inman Square in Cambridge, and he showed me the apartment that he lived in for several years and reminisced about that. It was really wonderful. And um, relating to his work on oxidative phosphorization, I can remember cleaning the bottom of his boat. And I really remember the name of that boat was Complex 4, which I just assumed was his fourth boat named Complex because I was a silly physics student. I didn't know better. It was only later I realized it was part of the electron transport chain that he played an instrumental role in discovering. Um, so after that work, you know, he went on to uh, MR spectroscopy and some of the first uh, in vivo uh, human MR spectroscopy work, but it was always you know, driven by optical methods um, and optical spectroscopy and um, wanted to use optical methods to better understand cellular energetics uh, in humans. And this has really led to the emerging field, you know, biomedical optics. Back in the day, it was emerging. Um, now it's very well established. So he first did his biomedical optics work in 1988, actually with a time-resolved spectroscopy system to measure uh, absolute path lengths of photon migration paths through the tissue. Um, in order to do quantitative spectroscopy. He presented that work at SPIE first in 1990. And then in 1993, started the Photon Migration and Imaging Conference that for many of us here, I believe, was really the start of, of diagnostic biomedical optics. And um, co-chairing with him was Bob Alfano, the first recipient of this award, um, and the second recipient, Jim Fujimoto, and his group presented some of their original OCT uh, work at this conference. And Brian Wilson was at this uh, meeting, as well as Li Hong Wang, um, as well as my original work with Britain Chance. So that was um, the original work started the summer of 92. And just after start, uh, passing the qualifying exams, went over to Britain Chance's lab. And um, he introduced me to a frequency domain near infrared spectroscopy device. And he wanted us to use that to try to quantify the optical properties in tissue. So my first two weeks was actually learning how to use that device. It was basically a ham radio attached to a laser diode and a photomultiplier tube, but it amazingly worked, right? Um, so we could deliver that light into a fish tank that was mimicking the optical properties of tissue. 
Enrico Gruton and his group had just shown that you could quantify the, the um, optical properties of the tissue using multi-distance measurements. In particular, they showed that this phase of light increased linearly with separation from the source. So Arjun Yod, being a good physicist, he kind of got excited about that. He was like, well, this, this diffusing wave, uh, these diffusing photons are somehow producing a, a, a wave that has a coherent phase. He said, well, if you measure the phase throughout the fish tank, it should have, be, be a spherical wave. So I was working with Maureen O'Leary, uh, my fellow student, uh, graduate student, and um, we spent six hours on July 24th, I um, remember from my notebook, um, recording the amplitude and phase at every point in the fish tank, and then went home that night and plotted it up. You had to do it by, at, by hand at those days, actually. Um, and it was uh, spherical contours emanating from the source. So the next day, Arjun said, well, you should put a boundary in the fish tank and have whole milk and skim milk, and you should see refraction of this, this wave. And sure enough, that's what we saw. Now, we were just kind of blown away by this because these were diffusing photons. How could diffusing photons create this coherent wave? So it was really after seven weeks of those experiments, heck, forgive me, 17 days, 17 days from our first experiment, we submitted this paper to Physical Review Letters that was then accepted. And um, I really wish all of my papers were that easy. Um, but it was a great start uh, to um, my, my research career. So Maureen O'Leary and I continued working on, on, on these methods, and after a couple years, we were able to demonstrate the first experimental diffuse optical tomography images of an absorbing contrast uh, in, in a fish tank. But my job was actually to bridge between Arjun's lab and Britain Chance's lab. So I had to um, go back to Arjun's lab and use diffusing wave spectroscopy that he was using to study the dynamics of colloidal systems, and I had to figure out some way to bring that into the biomedical space. Um, and so I had to drive the correlation diffusion equation, um, which would consider not just the optical properties of the medium, but also the dynamic properties of the medium, which then could use to pr produce images of dynamic contrast in the media. So Britton Chance, he was a little, he was interested, but he said, well, what can you do in vivo with that? And he showed me his $50 Runman device. It was a near infrared spectroscopy device, and he showed me if he put it on his forearm and used a blood pressure cuff, he could occlude blood flow and see the deoxygenation of the blood. So I took that device back to Arjun's lab and used his $100,000 system and measured blood flow. And sure enough, during arterial occlusion, blood flow dropped to zero, and this was, as Bruce was saying, you know, the first measurement on myself. It was the first diffuse correlation spectroscopy measurement uh, in vivo. Um, so this field has continued to to progress, and, and um, only the last few years have some um, um, prototype, sorry, commercial systems become available, so more and more people can jump in. I'm, I can't believe 20 years after doing this, I'm still learning about how amazing this technology is, and I really expect it to explode in the coming years in terms of uh, uh, interesting clinical applications. So at this point, I was ready to graduate and get my PhD, and um, reflecting back, I really got to work with an outstanding group of people in Britain Chance's lab. So this is the t-shirt I was given uh, when I graduated. It was signed by everybody in the lab and just kind of look at the names of the people who were in the lab when I graduated and, and just the amazing work they're doing today. They're all students and fellows at that time. Um, there was also just an amazing string of people coming through the lab. There's just too many um, to list, but I just want to point out these three. Uh, David Delpy and Marco Ferrari were um, instrumental in the clinical translation of the near infrared spectroscopy in the 80s and 90s and uh, even on to today. And Arno Villinger was uh, one of the first to do functional near infrared spe spectroscopy of, human, um, of brain activity in humans. Um, I graduated and somehow I didn't have a job. Um, and, and Britton Chance told me, David, don't worry. Everything's going to be OK. Um, and, and so I went on vacation. Um, <laughs> so. I didn't know at the time, but I now realize that actually Britton Chance and Arno Villinger had a plan um, because they knew of this great work coming um, on uh, using MRI to measure brain activity. Um, this, uh, Bruce Rosen and Jack Belvo uh, published this uh, first fMRI paper um, in humans in science in 1991. Arno Villinger had out actually worked with Bruce Rosen during the 80s, so he was very much aware of this work and quickly followed after it 
using near-infrared light to measure brain activation in humans. Britain Chance followed that by getting an image of brain activation in humans and comparing it with fMRI, showing good spatial registration. And in 1995, Arno Villinger had a optical brain, human brain imaging workshop that he invited these guys to, um, including Bruce Rosen. And, and Bruce was telling me recently that it was actually at that meeting that he realized, oh my goodness, I gotta be doing optical imaging, which eventually led to him uh, hiring me. Um, Bruce Rosen also told me that when Arno was working with him at Mass General Hospital, they um, did actually the uh, functional measurements in rats that led to the human work, and they actually did it on what they called the chance magnet, which was the first high field magnet um, that was 1.5 Tesla, and there was actually only, only two in the world. It was this one that we always see uh, in this image with Britain Chance with his leg in the magnet, and there's one other which was at Mass General Hospital. Um, so when I was hired, my job was actually to use optical methods to better understand bold fMRI. So um, bold fMRI was developed in 1991, um, two, and um, it was growing very rapidly, bold fMRI. Um, and, but they didn't know, they knew it was related to deoxyhemoglobin, but, but there was a lot of other factors. Functional near-infrared spectroscopy, you know, we had a better understanding on what it was telling us about uh, hemoglobin concentrations. So when I started, there was only 40 papers in the field, um, and that's a really good time to start in a field that's gonna grow quite large. Um, we had to build our first prototype system. Um, I was very lucky to work with Andy Siegel, who was a really great electrical engineer. He built the system, and being a good engineer, he tested it on himself, um, and did finger tapping tasks, which increases local hemoglobin concentration, absorbing more light. So we saw this very nicely. We said, this is working, this is great. We need to build a bigger system to image brain activation on the whole head. We were very lucky to meet um, Winfield Hill, um, who told us, well, you know, instead of hiring one engineer, you could contract 10. So he introduced us to TechN, and we've had a wonderful 16-year relationship with them, developing iteration after iteration of FNIR's devices that are sold commercially now. And so I must disclose I've received pat um, royalties for the sales of these, these systems. So we now had this FNIR's system that we could combine with fMRI to really address this question of what is bold telling us about the underlying hemodynamic response to brain activation. Ted Huppert um, came along at the right time. He was a, a student from Harvard, and he did great work, and he's now a uh, professor at University of, of Pittsburgh. Um, so he did the simultaneous FNIRS and fMRI experiment and did a full spatial temporal analysis comparing them and really helped validate what the, how the bold model was related to deoxyhemoglobin and total hemoglobin concentration. Having established that, um, we wanted to go further. We wanted to see what additional information could we get from um, these data. So this was the response to a two-second finger-tapping task um, in, in five subjects. This is showing the group average. And we fit this data with a biophysical model, and part of that biophysical model was actually what is the evoked change in the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen. Um, so I was quite excited about this because it's getting closer to what the underlying neuronal activity is. It's a metabolic indicator of the, the neuronal activity, which is much closer than this blood flow response. I was also excited about it because it was getting me closer to Britain Chance's work on oxidative phosphorylation. phosphorylation. Um, and so this kind of drove me to move from macroscopic measurements to more microscopic measurements. We first started imaging the cortical surface of rodents. Um, I was very lucky to work with Andy Dunn, and we did some of the first multispectral and laser speckle images on the cortical surface. And then working with Anna DeVore, really we were able to detail that, um, how the vascular response was representing the underlying neuronal activity. But we wanted better spatial resolution, so we turned to two-photon microscopy um, to delve more deeply into neurovascular coupling. More recently, we've been looking actually at mapping oxygen throughout the vasculature and the tissue and combining this with NADH, which is allowing me now to really get much closer to the oxidative phosphorylation work that Brent Chance was working on. Um, tomorrow, I'll have the opportunity to tell you more about the work that we've been doing on using laser speckle methods to measure blood flow at a microscopic level. So please um, come to that. Um, so um, 
I've been very fortunate to be able to work at this interface of photonics and neuroscience um, for the last 16 years, when at the beginning there was very little interface between optics and neuroscience. And this has just been growing tr quite tremendously over the last uh, two decades. And it's, I'm, it's really fantastic that SBIE recognized the importance of this interface between photonics and neuroscience and launched this journal, Neurophotonics. And I'm, I'm very happy, it was launched in 2014. I'm very happy to report that it's actually doing, um, performing very strongly. So keep watching that journal and please submit your, your articles to it. At the same time in 2014, we were celebrating 20 years of uh, functional near infrared spectroscopy. Um, and we had this special issue in neuroimage in which there were 58 um, articles published. Um, and mind you, the first five years of FNIRS, there was only 40 papers published. So it was quite amazing, this one issue, covering the breadth of um, applications for FNIRS. I want to point out, last year in 2015, there was over 400 papers published in the field of FNIRS. So it's growing very rapidly. It's very strong. One thing I always struggled with over the years was how to bring all of these um, um, users and, and, and application developers and mix them with the technology developers. And that was a really challenging problem. And so eventually, in 2010, we just organized a conference uh, at Harvard and brought all these people together. And it was a huge success. So we had to repeat it in London in 2012 and in Montreal in 2014. To keep this going, we had to organize this society for, for FNIRS. Um, and the next meeting is going to be in Paris. Um, and it's a lot of fun, that meeting, just getting together all of the technology developers with the application users. And they now outnumber us two to one. Um, so I think back to 1997, when Britton Chance was meeting with these three. And they were talking about FNIRS that was very young at the time and all of the tremendous opportunity for it. We had our first official executive committee meeting of the society uh, in Montreal in 2014. And so it seems quite fitting to me that those on the, the executive committee all trained with uh, those, those uh, four. I also really, at this opportunity, I have to thank the P41 mechanism and NIBIB because they funded this FNIRS work from 1998. And it's because of their mission of disseminating technologies that it really led to ultimately to the formation of the society. So that P41 mechanism, at least for, for me in this field, has been a tremendous uh, uh, benefit. Um, so I would just like to wrap up um, by uh, telling you my years with BC were a very exciting time. There was numerous exciting ideas pulling us in many different directions. I've been fortunate to remain in such an environment since then. Without B uh, BC's continued guidance on identifying and chasing the best questions, I would have gotten lost amongst the wondrous opportunities years ago. BC exemplified the importance of balancing hard work with hard play by always making time to go sailing. Reflecting back over the years, I can recall numerous problems solved and novel new insights um, that occurred while walking through the woods or even while sailing. I have no doubt that BC's love of and devotion to sailing strengthened his scientific accomplishments throughout his career. It feels fitting to me that my last visit with BC was actually in 2006 when he was finally closing his lab at the University of Pennsylvania when he was 93 years old. After a day at Penn, um, he and his wife Shoko and I drove to his boat at the New Jersey shore and we spent the night anchored out in the bay. He and I actually slept in the cockpit under that night because the, the stars were very beautiful. I woke in the middle of the night because a strong wind had come up and BC was no longer there. I looked around the boat, I found him up at the front of the boat at the, the bow and he was checking the anchor because he was worried that in the strong wind the anchor might be dragging. So I went up and I was like, oh my goodness, what are you doing there? I have to help you. And he said, no, no, David, I'm so sorry to wake you up. Please go back to bed. I've got this under control. And I really had no choice because it was clear to me um, I just had to go back to bed because it was clear that even at 93, he was really the best person to solve the problem. So thank you very much. Yeah.